thank you guys for coming. Um, so today I'm going to talk a bit about viruses that infect bacteria. I'm not going to talk about the viruses that infect us, like the one that I'm just now getting over. Um, so I, I do want to say a couple of things before I get started. Um, one, I am getting over a cold. I've got my water, I've got my tissue, I've got my cough drops. If I should need them, hopefully I won't. Um, two, I've been told that I have a tendency to talk fast, especially when I am excited, which I am always when I'm talking about my research. So if I'm talking too fast, like do this. Um, and then third, I wanted this to be um, something that's a bit more informal. Uh, I would like, if you guys have questions, if you need clarification on anything I said, please feel free to interrupt me throughout the, the course of this. Um, I have probably too many slides and I'm prepared to move past some of them if need be. Um, so again, my, my feeling is, is that I'm here um, to help uh, share with you some of the research that we've been doing, why we think that it's relevant, um, and, and put it into a broader context. And so it's more, most important for me that, that you feel like you've learned something when you walk out. So please, please make sure to, to interrupt me if you need any clarification. Um, so I actually, my PhD is actually in marine sciences, and my group studies uh, marine bacteria that live in the oceans. And so some of you may ask um, why someone who does that would work at a university that's in a landlocked state. Um, and so I'll take this moment to just remind you that the Earth's surface is 70% covered by the oceans. And so, you know, this is perhaps a more typical view of the world that we see, but if you rotate that 180 degrees, maybe it better illustrates the vastness that, is, uh, that are the oceans. Um, and it is because, in part, they cover such an expansive region of our Earth's surface, and the microbes that reside within these ocean waters are playing processes that are critical to all of Earth's biogeochemical processes cycle. Um, so I had had generated this morning a prompt, which I've promptly left sitting on my office desk. Um, but what that was was an Eppendorf tube that we use in the lab that was filled with one milliliter of water. Um, and the purpose that I, in, for, for putting that prop together and then failing to bring it, was anyways, was to just give you guys an illustration of just how much um, a milliliter of water is. It is less than a teaspoon, I will say that. And so when we think about the numbers of microbes that exist in the surface oceans of the open ocean, on average, there's a million microbial cells in every milliliter of water. Again, less than a teaspoon of water. And so those organisms, while not visible to the naked eye, are carrying out these processes that are essential for Earth as we know it. This is an image here that was taken from uh, a, a research expedition. I have to be careful not to say cruise, particularly amongst uh, my colleagues who um, have this idea that when we go out to sea that we spend 90% of our time on the Lido deck drinking mojitos. <laughs> um, that turns out not to be the case. But at any rate, so in October of this year, I and, and colleagues went out on a research expedition uh, to a region of the North Atlantic Ocean called the Sargasso Sea, which is about 80 miles south of Bermuda. And what this image is showing is this is showing a, a collection vessel that we deploy over the, the boat. It's called a CTD for conductivity temperature depth. And so this um, rosette that contains these bottles that allow for um, collection of water from discrete depths um, into the ocean is deployed over the side of the ocean and it's taking measurements as it goes down. So you, you're learning something, you're sitting on the ship and in real time you're getting information about what the temperature is, what the salinity is, what the light penetration is at depth. You get those profiles once you deploy that unit to whatever depth, bottom depth that you're interested in <coughs> and then you make decisions as it comes back up where you want these bottles to be deployed so that they're capturing the water at discrete depths. And so part of the reason that I'm showing this image is just, um, if you're not familiar with it, 
yourself that out in the open ocean, this water looks almost crystal clear, right? But again, um, in every milliliter of this water, we have uh, a million back, uh, microbes. And so what are those microbes doing? So there's a they, they're doing so many different things, but I just really want to focus on a couple of key ones that are relevant, immediately relevant to the type of research that my lab does. So it turns out that collectively, photosynthetic organisms in the ocean, the overwhelming majority of which are microbial, so little tiny plants that you can't see with your naked eye, are responsible for fixing approximately half of the carbon dioxide that's fixed annually on a global basis. So that means that oceanic systems are rivaling um, land plants and terrestrial systems in terms of CO2 drawdown. Now, in addition to photosynthesis playing this role in CO2 drawdown, it of course also is producing oxygen, which we are dependent upon, right? And so when we think about even the evolution of life on Earth, that was really facilitated through the evolution of oxygen evolving photosynthesis, which occurred in cyanobacteria billions of years ago. And so these organisms, those types of organisms still reside in the oceans today, drawing down carbon dioxide and also releasing oxygen, which of course we're again dependent on. So about half of global primary productivity, so that's taking carbon dioxide from the oxygen and converting it into organic matter, essentially biomass, um, happens globally. Half of that occurs in the ocean. Again, principally mediated by microbes, things that you're not seeing with the naked eye. The fate of that material is essentially twofold. Half of it enters the classic marine food web. It's eaten by organisms that are progressively larger than the, ne than, than the next, entering um, uh, or ultimately ending up in you know, what we consider sort of the charismatic uh, megafauna of the oceans, things that maybe you're most familiar with, fish and the like. However, the other half of it, which again is equivalent to a quarter of that carbon that's fixed globally enters the microbial realm. So these organisms are responsible for these, these heterotrophic organisms, the ones that are responsible for transforming this newly fixed carbon, um, are critical in not only carbon cycles, but a variety of um, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, and so on. And so to, again, 25% of global primary productivity passes through the marine microbial food web. And so it's these heterotrophic marine bacteria that my um, group studies. And so this is, is an image that's sort of focusing a little bit more on these heterotrophic bacteria and highlights the various roles that they play. So they are capable certainly of utilizing the dissolved fraction of organic material but they also are really good at dealing with the particulate material. Um, and so one of the two, two things that I want to highlight from this image are the so-called biological pump and the microbial carbon pump. And so these relate to processes that are concerned with long-term storage of carbon. And so I talked to you before about the role of phytoplankton, microorganisms that are photosynthetic, of taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and converting it into organic matter. That carbon dioxide, uh, or excuse me, that carbon, some of it's going to be returned to the atmosphere through processes of the decomposition or degradation of this material. And that's mediated by um, heterotrophic bacteria and then also through classic food webs as organisms respire, they're returning that carbon to the atmosphere. However, there is a possibility for this material, this recently fixed carbon that's in phytoplankton, to make its way to the depths of the ocean through a couple of different processes. One is the so-called biological pump. So you can have um, blooms of phytoplankton. These would be naturally uh, occurring annual blooms of phytoplankton that are, that are an important part of um, the carbon cycles uh, in the world's oceans, not to be confused with um, harmful algal blooms that we're hearing a lot about. 
So these are naturally occurring um, algal blooms. And as that material, as those organisms die, their bodies can sink to the depths of the ocean. As they're sinking, the depths of the ocean, on average, the ocean is 4,000 meters deep. It can take a lot of time for the, that material to sink to the depths of the ocean. And so microbes, these heterotrophic microbes, are colonizing that particular organic matter and transforming, utilizing some of it, thus returning some of that carbon to the atmosphere, or as it goes deeper and deeper into the ocean, it's that carbon isn't returned to the atmosphere immediately, it becomes just super saturated in the depths of the ocean. So that's the so-called biological pump, so it's a, it's a conduit for taking carbon from the atmosphere to the depths of the ocean where it could actually remain for thousands of years. And so there's been um, some e interest in recent years in terms of trying to promote phytoplankton growth in the surface oceans to help grease this biological pump in order to um, facilitate that capture of carbon from the atmosphere and, and store it at depths in, in, in the bottom of the ocean. Of course, some of the complicating factors with that is the rate at which these organisms might utilize that material and actually not allow it to be um, distributed to depths. Yeah? What does PON, PON oh, for? I'm sorry. Dissolved organic matter, particulate organic matter. That's uh, very important. See, this is, a <laughs> this is why you need to ask questions. Um, and I appreciate that you do. So things that are dissolved can readily pass through um, bacterial cell membranes, assuming that, they, that these bacteria have the appropriate transporters. Particulate organic matter, um, oftentimes if microbes are going to break that material down, they have to excrete enzymes extracellularly to do that initial stages. And then once that material is broken down to uh, molecular weight that's sufficiently small enough that they then transport it into the cell. Okay, so the biological pump, and then secondarily, there's this so-called microbial carbon pump, and this is idea that's, that's only relatively recent, maybe five or 10 years, and an idea in that as heterotrophic marine bacteria are utilizing organic matter that's present in the world's oceans, they're transforming it in a way that makes the products more recalcitrant or less able to be degraded. And so that's contributing to the vast stores of carbon in the depths of the ocean. And in fact, when you look at the amount of carbon that's in the depths of the ocean, so I would say 1,000 meters and lower, compared to what's um, in the surface oceans, there's 40 times more carbon in the depths of the ocean than there is in the surface ocean. <coughs> okay, so. Um, again, I'm lacking my handy dandy little prop, but I was going to hold up the test tube and say, I just told you guys a few minutes ago that there's a, just envision it, work with me, that there's a million microbial cells in every milliliter of seawater. That's a lot, right? I think it's a lot. It's still astounding to me. I've known this number for a long time, but every, I'm still like, wow. Um, it turns out that there are 10 times as many viruses in that same milliliter of water. I know, right? And so what this is, and, and by the way, I think this is important to say, um, we have only known about this since 1999, uh, right? So when I'm talking to um, students in my classes, they're like, well, that's a really long time ago. And I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> but, so essentially, this discovery was made in 1999 when Jed Furman, a microbial oceanographer, basically took a sample of seawater and filtered it through a filter that had really, really small pore sizes, 20 nanometers. That's about 10 times smaller than what we usually use um, when trying to filter bacteria out of some liquid, okay? And so he, he filters seawater onto this filter, and then he applies a fluorescent dye that binds nucleic acids so that he can then visualize these things using an epifluorescent microscope. And so that's what this is showing. And so um, this may look like a starry night to you. Um, and, and, and honestly, this is what these things look like under the microscope. And so there's two key, key features here, right, is, is that you see blobs of essentially two different sizes. You see some bigger blobs, and then you see these pinpricks in the back. So these bigger blobs are microbes. They're principally bacteria. There's some archaea here as well, of course. 
But in the background, these things that look like they're hazy in the distance, those are viral particles. Those are what? Viral particles. Viral, okay. Or we assume them to be viral particles. <clears throat> they are smaller than these microbial cells, um, principally because they are physically smaller and because they have much less DNA than their microbial counterparts and what's allowing us to visualize them again as this stain that's specifically binding nucleic acids. So um, people have, since 1999, people have gone uh, throughout the um, world's oceans collecting samples using those devices, like so CTD devices that I had shown you uh, a picture of a few minutes ago to collect samples and to actually do these types of measurements. And I'll tell you that the standard in the field still today for enumerating viruses in seawater is microscopic counts. Um, and so people have, have done that for several decades and have determined that there's that this ratio of, of, of 10 to 1, 10 viral particles for every microbial cell seems to hold pretty strong. And so that's illustrated in this, um, in this image here, which is showing this relationship between viruses and microbes. And this is just um, uh, separating the samples based on the deep oceans versus the surface oceans. OK. Um, so I had so shown you the, 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 the starry night um, image which was taken using uh, epifluorescence microscopy at about a, a thousand times magnification. And you just saw these little pinpricks, right? Um, so a colleague of mine, Jennifer Brun at um, LSU, when she was a postdoc, she went out and she said, well, I'd really like to get a look at what, like, I'd like to have a better resolution than these little pinpricks, right? And so she went out and she collected samples. And then she used a higher magnification microscopy, essentially scanning electron microscopy, to get an idea of what <coughs> these viruses look like. And so this is an image from her paper that was published in 2013, showing the most common types of viruses that are found in seawater. I probably should say that the samples that she was analyzing was from a research exposition called the Terra Oceans that crossed the entirety um, of the world's oceans taking samples with great frequency. So this is not a matter of her going to one particular spot in let's say the North Atlantic Ocean like I did a couple of months ago, but rather it's a collective of samples from across the ocean, the oceans. And so she basically identified four major types, and this is what they look like. And so it turns out that these four major types look a lot like things that have been seen previously um, that are, have, have been known for some time to infect bacteria. Um, you'll note there's a scale bar here um, for 100 nanometers, and so on average, most of the viruses that she was able to quantify using this approach and that would also have been visible using epifluorescent microscopy probably fall in the range of, like the very low range would be 10 nanometers up to 100 nanometers. And so, um, in addition to knowing that there's a lot of viruses in the oceans, um, there's also been some work to demonstrate what impacts they're having on the microbes that are present in those systems. And so through the, um, a number of, of manipulative experiments, it's been estimated that upwards of 30% of the standing stock of microbes in the surface oceans are lysed daily as a result of viral activity. That's a lot, right? There's a lot of mortality going on. We don't hear the screams, but it's happening. Um, and so uh, another colleague of mine, uh, Myra Britbart, who's at um, University of South Florida, uh, had this series of cartoons in this review article that she had written for annual reviews of microbiology. And this is one of my favorite dye bacteria. So this is supposed to be a virus of a, of a bacterium killing it. 
Um, and so as she puts in, in the caption, phages are efficient killers of marine bacteria, releasing 10 billion tons of carbon per day, right? So they are just like killing machines. Um, now, the fate of that material, so they're killing these microbes, but it turns out that it seems like there's a lot of benefits to the rest of the community that's not been lysed. And, and that is principally through the release of the intracellular constituents of those cells, then becomes valuable nutrients and food for the other organisms that, that have escaped um, lysis. Um, and then heterotrophs, these are the guys that depend on preformed organic matter as a food source. We are heterotrophs. We can't make we cannot take inorganic carbon from the atmosphere and, and use it to make more of ourselves. We have to eat other things. That, so, okay. All right. So, um, so I just said, I think I said, uh, viruses kill a lot of bacteria in the world's oceans. And so um, that process, that killing, um, has been termed the viral shunt. Um, and it's been termed the viral shunt because uh, it's believed that through the lysis, of these bacteria, it is short-circuiting the transfer of carbon and energy from microbes, either autotrophs or heterotrophs, to higher trophic levels, right? And so instead, what it's doing is returning the material from these living organisms to the dissolved organic matter pools and the particulate organic pool. So it's now putting it back. It's keeping it in the realm of the microbes. Um, and so, um, Again, I feel like it's important to stress the timeline with regards to this knowledge, right? So, so in, in, in 2000, this, this recognition of the number of viruses, and then it still took many, many more years before these viral production measurements were capable, uh, were being made and estimates have been made about the number of uh, microbes that have been killed and the impacts that that has had on microbial communities, right? So this is all to say that this field of viral ecology is a very young one, okay? So this is all still, still a new area. Um, and so through the action of this viral lysis, there's lots of questions about how viruses and their hosts interact and what, to if any extent, does viral activity do things like influence the rate at which heterotrophic microbes that are colonizing particulate organic matter that might be sinking to the depths of the ocean, how, how might it influence that? Um, and or the microbial carbon pump, right? Again, thinking about the roles of these microorganisms in transforming organic matter from one form to another. So, so this is my way of saying it's critical to understand how viruses interact with their host and marine systems because of the essential role of microbes in global biogeochemical cycles. All right, so that's the end of part one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so part two is, um, so what are these viruses? Like, what's this thing about viruses that kill microbes? Okay, so it turns out that we've known, or someone has known, uh, for well over 100 years that there are viruses that infect and kill bacteria. And so this discovery was made independent, two times independently, once in 1915 and once in 1917, it, that we didn't have access to the World Wide Web. Information was, was transferred very slowly across continents. Um, and so two independent discoveries in 1915 and 1917 that there are these viruses that actually infect and kill bacteria. And so we have th those, those who study um, the viruses of bacteria, which um, I need to introduce you to a term, which is Viruses of bacteria are called bacteriophage, and that comes from the Latin phage for to eat or to devour. So these are things that eat or devour bacteria. Oftentimes they're just called phage. I will try not to use that term, but the reality is, is that sometimes I'll slip and say it. Um, so there have been, or people have suggested that there have been three ages of phages. Um, the first was from their initial discovery in the early mid-1910s mid to about 1940. So the initial discovery that, yes, there's viruses that actually kill bacteria. Ooh, bacteria make people sick. Maybe we can use these viruses to prevent the growth of, of pathogenic microbes. And so that is called phage therapy, right? And so that was all in the rage, and particularly in the former Soviet Union. A lot of work 
um, and, and application of viruses to um, prevent the growth of microbial pathogens. However, with the advent of antimicrobials, phage therapy fell out of fashion. Um, and so from 1940 to 1970, there was actually this resurgence in interest in phage because of viruses of microbes, um, because these um, systems are really tractable for discovering aspects of uh, molecular cell biology. And so some of the most fundamental um, discoveries of how genetic material um, translates into proteins were made using viruses of bacteria. So, for instance, understanding that mutations are random, that was discovered using viruses. Understanding that DNA is, in fact, the um, material that imparts genetic heredity, that was determined using viruses. And, and that's just a few. There are many, many Nobel Prizes in the area of molecular biology that were achieved by people who were using phage as a, as a way to better understand how DNA makes RNA, makes protein in cells. Um, and then, at about 1970, people were like, I think we know everything we need to know about the viruses of microbes, in large part because this was really, the, the work during this time was uh, led to very deep understanding of a limited number of systems, particularly viruses that infect pathogenic organisms. Um, and then 2000, right around the time that um, that discovery was made that there's all these viruses in seawater, that was the first um, revelation that viruses are, super, particularly viruses of, of microbes, are extremely abundant in pretty much any system that you have microbes. It's just that, from a technical standpoint, it's a lot easier to see that in an aqueous mixture than it is to try to look at them, um, see them when you're thinking about your microbial gut community, right? Because there's a lot of other things in there. Um, and so this recognition that viruses are everywhere and that really most of these viruses infect bacteria is something that has really led to this um, uh, new uh, and important field of viral ecology. And, and again, I, I, I'm talking about this in the context of marine systems, but there has just been an explosion in this area, particularly um, thinking about how the human virome um, those viruses that reside in and around us are influencing our microbiomes. Um, and then there's also, because of, I'm sure that you all are aware, that there's a lot of concern with regards to um, resistance to antimicrobials um, and, and the identification of new antimicrobials that are um, effective against some of the most serious human pathogens. There's been um, a resurgence of interest in phage therapy. So maybe viruses aren't such a bad idea after all. Maybe that they can help us deal with um, some of these microbial pathogens. Okay, and to that end, I thought I would, for, for those of you who don't know, um, in 2006, the FDA approved the use of phage for, um, uh, uh, approved the use of phage in food processing um, and, and production. And so this is just showing a snapshot of some of these images of, of different phage virus cocktails that are active against different organisms like Listeria, um, E. coli, and Seminella. So phage are actually being used um, in the um, prevention of uh, the growth of specific microbial pathogens in the food processing sector. There is a lot of interest also, though, in looking at them for use in uh, clinical settings for humans. Okay, that was a sidebar. Okay, so we've known about viruses that infect bacteria, these phage, for over 100 years. So it turns out that these viruses come in, in two flavors when we think about their lifestyles. The first is um, an obligately lytic life cycle, which is shown here. 
And so you have a virus, which is shown in pink up there, that's got a cute little tail. Um, and on the ends of those tails, it has um, uh, uh, molecular sequences that help it specifically identify a target on the cell surface of its, its host. Um, and so once it attaches to the host surface, it injects its nucleic acid into the host, and then it subverts the host machinery, takes advantage of the enzymes within the cell to actually make more viral genomes and the parts of the virus that it needs. So I should say viruses, most viruses of microbes are essentially nucleic acid and protein. Nucleic acid on the inside and then they're, they're coated by this um, protein containing capsid and then some of them will have this tail. Um, so it basically subverts the host um, machinery to make more of itself and then ultimately um, it will lice its host and its progeny will be released out into the environment. And so this is actually showing a transmission electron micrograph of an E. coli cell that has been infected by one of its viruses, these T4 viruses. And so you can see that it sticks all out on the outside. And then on the inside you can see that these are viral particles, virions, that are being formed. This is right before lysis, right? This guy's not going to make it. Um, so this is um, a lytic lifestyle. And there are lots of viruses that infect bacteria. This is the only lifestyle they know. It's the only thing they're capable of. When they uh, um, interact with a susceptible host, it, they will initiate a lytic lifestyle. However, there's this alternate lifestyle, which is called a lysogenic lifestyle. And that's illustrated here. This is the same image as you saw before. The only thing that's added is what you see here. And so with viruses that are capable of this lysogenic lifestyle, once they inject their DNA into their host, that DNA can actually be integrated into the host genome. And that virus basically hangs out, gets replicated with the host genome when the cell is growing and dividing, and it can be passaged on through the population that way. Um, and so it just hangs out until there's some sort of signal that tells it, mm, maybe I should initiate a lytic lifestyle. And so that's called induction. And so when, when viruses that are integrated into the genome um, receive this signal, they will be induced and they'll initiate this lytic life cycle. I know. Crazy. Okay. So it's considered that, so for a number of viruses of, of bacteria, the molecular mechanisms that dictate whether or not the virus stays integrated into the genome or becomes induced and initiates a lytic life cycle have been worked out. And it is mediated by regulatory proteins that while the virus is in the lysogenic state, basically just sit on key points in the viral genome to prevent the transcription and translation of, of viral DNA. And it's the relief of that repression that allows for the lytic life cycle. And so this has been oftentimes considered to be a bistable switch. It's either on or it's off. And so what causes an otherwise happy relationship between a host and a virus? to go from this lysogenic state to this lytic state. Any guesses, like just gen generically speaking, what might cause a virus to be like, I got to go? Could be temperature? Yes, that is one of them. It is essentially, broadly speaking, stress, stress yeah. right? And so the, the way that this is oftentimes um, described is it's like rats getting off a sinking, sinking ship. They're like, I don't know, things don't look good for this host. 
I better make more of myself and get the heck out of here and see if I can't find somebody else to, to reside in. And so there have been a lot of stressors that have been identified as critical inducers of viral induction. And so these are things like nutrients, like decreased nutri nutrients, changes in pH, temperature, antibiotics. I'll tell you what, this is the way that you get viruses out of your bacteria in the lab. You just give your bacteria just like sublethal amounts of the antibiotic and the virus is like, I'm going. Um, hydrogen peroxide, that's a great stress. Foreign DNA, um, UV light, critical in um, surface marine systems, um, and then oxidative stress. So a whole host of different stressors. Um, so I wanted to just, in these next couple of slides, I'm, I'm showing you, these are our um, uh, mock-ups of this figure that I'm trying to generate with some colleagues for uh, a review article on this. But I want to talk just briefly about what a host might get out of a, a relationship with one of these viruses that can integrate into its genome. And so there are lots and lots of examples a really complex and mutualistic interactions that occur between bacteria and viruses, particularly viruses that have the ability to integrate into the host of their genome, uh, into the genome of their host. Um, and so I've just indicated a few here. The first and probably most well known is immunity, immunity to super infection. So if I'm a bacterium and I've got virus A residing in my genome and a whole bunch of virus A particles come towards me, I'm immune. Nothing's happening to me. Or it doesn't even have to be the exact same virus as long as it's similar enough. Second, um, there are several examples of microbial pathogens who their virulence factors, which are essential for success as pathogens, come from viruses that infect them and integrate into their genomes. Right? And so the two classic examples are cholera toxin and diphtheria toxin. Both of those toxins are encoded in viruses that integrate into the genomes of their host, whether that be a Vibrio species for cholera or a Cornobacterium species for diphtheria. And it turns out, you know how I told you that um, what prevents viruses from being induced, initiating that lytic cycle, um, when they're integrated into the genome is, is you basically have these proteins that are preventing expression of certain genes. However, in some cases, some genes are expressed off of the viral genome when the virus is integrated into that host. And toxins are one class. And so this virus is integrated <laughs> into the genome and it's, it's residing in this happy mutualistic relationship with its host. And while it's integrated in there, it's helping its host um, by producing toxins that the toxin uses in order to um, successfully infect its host. Um, there's also been some really elegant examples very recently that have demonstrated that depending on where viruses integrate into the genome of their host, they themselves can serve as genetic regulatory mechanisms. So they can either be turning genes off or turning genes on. And so again, that's been that's been best characterized in a couple of microbial pathogens, right? You see where I'm going, like most of what we know about viruses and their hosts, and it, with good reason, um, is, is from microbial pathogens. Um, there's also, these are 2018, 2019, really, really recent studies that have demonstrated that um, viruses of, of selected bacteria are really important in the interactions of a bacterium with a potential host. One example is one that enables mutualism in which the virus that's integrated into the host genome actually produces um, a compound that prevents phagocytosis by a um, macrophage. So this bacterium forms a mutualistic relationship with a marine sponge and so as part of that uh, initiation of the mutualistic interaction, the bacterium has to make its way into host tissue. And so it, that means it has to get by the host's immune system, which is, in this case, principally macro macrophages. So uh, potential mutualistic 
organism, bacterium that doesn't have the virus, it's going to be more readily consumed by the host macrophage, its immune system. But if it has a virus within its genome and it's producing these molecules that somehow cloak the bacterium, so it's less susceptible to um, phagocytosis by the macrophage. And so that same type of, um, a very similar type of interaction has been seen in um, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, uh, MRSA, right? Methylene resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So those that have a specific uh, virus in their genome actually are capable of modulating their cell surface which makes them more able to escape our immune system. I know. Um, so in these cases, I'm giving you um, the host cell is, uh, or the, the specific um, physiologies or phenotypes that are helping the bacterium um, in a particular uh, uh, situation are encoded on the viral genome and that's being expressed while the genome is integrated into the, or the, yeah, the genome of the virus is integrated into the host genome. Okay. Um, so before I talk about this, I need to tell you something. So I, I, I had mentioned, I need to tell you something else. Um, I would mentioned this whole bistable switch when thinking about whether or not the virus stays in or initiates the lytic cycle. Um, and the way that it's typically considered it's either on or it's off for an entire population, right? Um, so it turns out that that's not always the case, right? Because there's always these genetic switches are subject to um, just inherent noise. And so typically we have something that's referred to as spontaneous induction that occurs in a very small subset of a population. It's usually less than 1%. So just a teeny tiny fraction of these cells just something's going to go haywire with the genetic regulatory system, and now that virus is going to um, initiate the lytic cycle, make more of itself, and pop out, right? Now, that's not a problem when you're growing this organism in culture because, again, remember I told you one of the advantages of having a virus integrated in your genome is it makes you immune to viral attack by the same virus, right? So you have a subset of the population it's making. It, it just randomly undergoes a spontaneous induction. You've got more viruses that are in there, but it's not a problem to those um, cells in the population that already have the virus integrated. Now, so this spontaneous induction where just a fraction of the population is lysed has also been demonstrated to be important in mutualistic interactions between viruses and their hosts. Um, one has to do with um, virulence factors again. So I talked about diphtheria and cholera in which those toxins are produced when the virus is integrated into the, stably integrated into the genome. The shiga toxin, which is produced by E. coli 057H7, right, so that toxin is encoded by a virus. And that toxin is only produced when the virus initiates its lytic cycle. And so the way that that works in that situation is a subset of the E. coli population will undergo induction, they'll die. Um, but the rest of the, but in that process, they'll be producing a toxin that th allows the rest of the population to move in. Um, more recently, and so again, that's something that's been known for some time. More recently is this idea that this spontaneous induction, again, in a very small set of the population, could be useful in terms of um, producing viruses that are active against the susceptible populations that are competitors. Right? And so that's shown here. So where you've got spontaneous induction in this um, yellow cell. So it's producing these viral particles which aren't going to affect the cells that already have that blue virus that's integrated in its genome. But if you have a susceptible host, you've got a couple of options. You're either going to succumb to a lytic infection or, it's not showing it here, or that virus is going to be integrated into your genome and you've effectively um, now become um, a part of the population that's carrying this virus. Okay, right, and so this is my, I'm not a huge Star Trek fan, but I do remember this, resistance is futile, right? Like assimilate or die. Okay, um, all right, so that's my uh, overview of 
viruses of bacteria. And so a couple of things that I, I, I want to make sure that I stress before I get into this last bit, which is oh, I'm not even going to have time to talk about it. Okay, so here, I'll, I can do it. Um, <laughs> you don't think I can, but I can. Um, but here's what I need to tell you. First of all, most of what we know of host virus interactions comes from viruses that infect medically relevant microbes. But we now know um, that there's probably lots to be learned by looking outside of that small set. So that's motivating a lot of our research, right? Two, I talked to you about these uh, viruses that can do this lys lysogenic lifestyle. It turns out, I think that this is important, it turns out that this is a really, really common thing. And so um, it is estimated that 40% of all bacteria that have been looked at, they don't even have to be cultured, but that have been looked at contain viruses in their genomes. This is something that is extremely common. All of those measurements that I was telling you about, like viruses are killing, right? That was really focused on absolutely lytic interactions that are happening in marine systems. There's so much that we don't know about potentially subtle interactions that are happening between viruses that can integrate into their host genome and their hosts, right? So that's sort of what prefaces this. And so about 10 years ago, I had a graduate student who, who went out looking for um, environmentally relevant bacteria and viruses that infect them. And so I will um, make a long story short, <laughs> and I will tell you um, that we have a bacterium that has a virus that's integrated into its genome. We were able to isolate another virus that looks so, so much like this virus. This is what this is showing, the sequence similarity at the DNA level. They're like 100% identical. I like to say they're, they're um, nearly identical except for they're not, right? Which is like these two regions here. These two viruses share an integration site in their host. This is something I didn't talk about, but um, the, 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 uh, there are certain viruses that when they integrate into their genome, they do it in a site-specific location. This is one of those. So they share an integration site. We were actually able to, just by simply doing an experiment where we added that virus to that host, we were to able to um, generate the same host, but it has the, the other virus now integrated in the exact same region. Right? So the, and we've sequenced a genome. So the only thing that's different between these two bacteria are their viruses that are integrated at the same site, and those viruses are really, really genetically similar, except where they're not. Um, and each one of these bacteria is susceptible to lytic infection by the opposing viral type. I know. OK, so now I'm just going to cut to that we've done competition experiments. Blah, 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 <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Um, and so I showed you before this image where you would have viruses produced by bacteria using a specific selective antagonistic agents against a susceptible um, host. What we've found is that there's a reciprocal attack. And so that's what I've tried to add, this additional color coding here. And so it turns out that one of our viruses, you remember how I said that, that, that viruses, they'll shed a few viruses, like right, a very small population, even when they're in a happy, non-stressed state, right? And so those few viruses, when you mix these two populations in co-culture, they'll go out, they'll attack the other guy. And when they do, it ends up causing a whole bunch of things. This is the last thing I say, I promise. It causes a lytic infection that produces the red viral type. You also get some subset that now have the blue virus replaced by the red virus. But you also, during this, end up inducing this blue guy. So when you infect the red, the blue virus containing cell with the red virus, you actually end up making both viral types and both progeny types. And so we've done 
um, competition experiments to see like, well, who will win in what situation? And it turns out that one of them wins when you grow it in liquid culture, like planktonically. The other one wins when you grow it as a biofilm, a community on a surface. I know. Um, OK, so all right, so I hope I've convinced you of the following. <laughs> Viruses of microbes are important players in marine ecosystems. Let's not kid ourselves. All systems. Um, the, a mechanistic understanding of most host virus interactions is unknown, and that's because of a bias, an appropriate one, towards those um, systems that uh, involve uh, biomedically relevant hosts. Um, and so we have a two virus, one host model system that reveals a new competitive interaction um, between infected host cells. And so the types of experiments that my lab is doing now is asking, um, you know, I gave an example, one, one virus host pair does better in a free swimming environment, the other does better when it's growth on a surface. So now we're moving towards um, asking whether and what happens when you begin to, to increase the complexity of the system by adding more in different types of microbes. So that's where I'll end, other than to acknowledge the number of graduate students who have been uh, critical to this project. And thank you for your attention. I totally blew the time. Well, it's not a theory, I think, that there's evidence that, that we see um, acidification. And that's linked to um, atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide. Um, and so uh, I think that, yes, right? So that is a potential trigger for some of these viruses. And that's something that people are very recently um, beginning to actually do manipulative experiments to test. Absolutely, and temperature as well. Yes? So if the oceans do acidify, and you were talking about mechanistic climate change, does that mean that there'd be just more carbon released from it sink in the ocean? I think the answer is, is we don't know. It's not as simple as that. Uh, I think, I think we, <coughs> I would want to be cautious about making um, conclusive statements with regards to that. Um, but there's very clear interactions between um, the pH and the effects um, for organisms, many of which, many marine organisms have calcium carbonate shells, and a lot of those organisms have microbial symbionts that are essential for their life, like corals. And so I think that there's a lot of evidence for stressors that are influencing corals, that there's a link to viruses that are associated with microbes that are symbionts of those organisms. That was probably more of a vague answer. Than one. Yeah. Did you have a question? Oh, go ahead. Well, when, you, when you're talking about the, the viral genome being integrated into the bacterial genome, is that, is that, that mechanism, is that also considered sort of a part of evolution as well, that, that, that it, can, it can make changes in the genome of something by bringing in material from the outside? Well, and here's the other thing. So I didn't even talk about that as, as, a, as, as part of the um, beneficial interactions between viruses and hosts. And, and for sure, it's genetic exchange. So uh, there's something called that's very well characterized called uh, uh, viral transduction. So viruses can, um, for a whole number of reasons, accidentally pick up host DNA when they're packaging what they think is just their DNA into their capsid, and then they can take that to a new organism. And so it's a very well established me mechanism for, yeah. for genetic transfer. Yep. Yep. So is it? Oh, I'm sorry. So in a very simplistic way, it's like the host DNA is antiviral. Well, hydrogen peroxide is, is antimicrobial for sure. Um, and when you say antiviral, I'm talking about it in the context of it's an, it's an 
it's indirect, right? Because it's not acting directly on the virus, it's acting on the bacterium, which initiates this SOS. It's not a great name for it, it's called the SOS stress response. Um, and so, yes, now, if you have free naked viruses, perhaps those that infect humans, they may be more susceptible to hydrogen peroxide, but here's the thing, I don't know anything about <laughs> viruses that infect eukaryotes. I have a colleague who does, if you would like to learn more about that, you should invite him to come talk. Well, so, so I don't know enough about that, but I would guess particularly when it's, when you're thinking about um, microbes, it's this recognition that um, most microbes have very defined and somewhat limited pH ranges in which they're able to grow. Um, and so I think that part of what that is is, is, is a more broad-based killing mechanism for uh, for those, at least MRSA. Um, I think one of the things that is potentially appealing about phage therapy, which is using viruses to kill um, microbes, is the potential for a highly selected and targeted approach. Because these viruses are usually have what's considered to be a fairly narrow host range, right? So for a lot of the antibiotics we take, you know, so, well, maybe they'll affect like one class of microorganisms, but it's usually still a really broad class, like gram-negative bacteria, right? And so, you know, there's a reason why it's suggested that people take probiotics after an antibiotic course, and that's because you've killed a lot of innocent bystanders in that process. So I think one of the things that's potentially appealing about phage therapies is a very targeted approach. You know that there's a pathogen in there that you want to get rid of, and so you could do that in a more directed fashion. Um, there are some, some potential issues with phage therapy, too, which is, have to do with uh, the rapid evolution of resistance. So, but anyways. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.